Thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Nick Steins. I'm a professor in history. Uh, and it is my honor today to introduce uh, Kaylee Gomez from business and Nate Kreit Herons uh, from history who have put together uh, today's uh, presentation around uh, this year's commemoration of uh, Cesar Chavez Week. So if you'll help me in welcoming them to the stage. Well, uh, thank you for coming out. And uh, as Dr. Sainz said, uh, as we honor the legacy of Cesar Chavez and we look at uh, kind of the long shadow that he projects on Chicano, uh, the Chicano movement in the United States and also uh, migrant farm workers in the United States. Um, Kaylee and I wanted to kind of delve deeper into who Chavez was as a man and how his character uh, helped shape the United Farm Workers Union. Um, and so to start off here, we titled our presentation Saint Caesar of Delano. And we chose the word saint uh, because in Chavez's workings with the union, with the United Farm Workers Union, he took on a persona of almost a saintly deity. Um, for an example, uh, in the procession marches uh, and the protests that Chavez would lead with the United Farm Workers Union during the, during the uh, great boycott strike of 1966, he would use posters of the Virgen de Guadalupe, uh, which is a huge symbol of revolutionary Mexico. And it had, brings with it symbols of revolution and social justice, um, but it's also a very religious symbol to the Catholic people. Um, and Chavez was a devout Catholic. Um, and so he incorporated these religious images in the movement uh, in the United Farm Workers Movement to make it more than just about farm workers, but about Chicano issues, about identity, about social justice. Um, so it overreached just the basic framework of a workers union. Um, and so he took on this saintly persona because of that. Um, so to direct your attention now to this picture up here, uh, this is an iconic image of the United Farm Workers Movement. Um, we have here represented the farm worker, uh, the name of Don Sotaco. Um, as you can see, he is pulling the patroncito, which is the big boss man who owns the fields in California, who owns all of the agriculture production fields in California. And driving the cart is El Coyote, or the labor contractor, who is also, who is also usually Mexican or Chicano himself, and who would contract out cheap labor from people like Don Sotaco, who are migrant workers, Mexican workers coming up from the border, uh, people who don't really have rights uh, and are kind of under the radar of American society. Um, and so this image codifies what it was like to be a farm worker in really 1930s to even today, in present times, we could say. Um, very oppressive system. And to give a little historical background on why farm workers we're in this predicament. In 1935, uh, Roosevelt, with the New Deal, created the um, National Labor Act, or the Wagner Act, um, which gave collective bargaining to uh, workers and the right to form unions. Um, but this was reserved for urban workers and workers in uh, industrial sectors. Uh, farm workers were taken out of this, of the Wagner Act, because of prior strikes and protests that were happening um, as in those strikes, the farm workers were labeled as communists and that label stuck and so with the fear of communism developing, um, the Wagner Act decided to leave out labor and migrant work, uh, farm labor as uh, deemed necessary to have unions or to have the right to have unions or collective bargaining. Um, so that sets up kind of a historical perspective of why so much oppression was happening in the fields of California and elsewhere in the West. And to start with the beginnings of Chavez's life, um, he was born in Yuma, Arizona in 1931. Um, his father lost his farm when he was about in the seventh grade, so he started going to school with a seventh grade education and started working in the fields. So he's already started his life knowing what it's like to work out in the fields so with that kind of like oppressive, like you didn't even finish high school. You have the seventh grade education, you're going to go out and you're going to work. And then uh, during when he becomes a young man, he moves to San Jose, California, to this area called Salty Quitas, which, which is pretty much the ghettos of California. And it means get out while you can. So while well, he's in California as a young man, he kind of has this kind of pachuco image, and a pachuco is kind of like this rebellious 
young man just kind of ready to kind of start a revolution. Kind of, he wants to start something as this move comes into place. So as Chavez uh, begins to settle down, he's still working in the fields at this time, and uh, he's living in Salsipuedes, uh, as Kaylee mentioned, uh, basically the, the ghetto of San Jose. Uh, he is a devout Catholic, and he started, he started a family. By this time, he has eight children uh, with his wife, <coughs> Martha, uh, who's also a farm worker. Um, and he, like I said, he's a devout Catholic. Um, and so he gets approached by Fred Ross and Saul Alinsky, who are part of this community service organization. And Fred Ross and Saul Alinsky became very famous in the 1930s, helping Okies from the Dust Bowl moving west to California to find work after uh, the Dust Bowl, which devastated their, their farms and their entire livelihood. A lot of a huge population of, of Okies, of white uh, farm workers from Oklahoma and other regions of the west moved to California to work in the fields as migrant farm workers because they had no other choice. And so Ross and Alinsky were key in organizing uh, these farm workers into voting campaigns. And they were looking to do the same, but this time with Mexican farm workers and migrant farm workers in California in the 50s. Um, and so Fred Ross heard about Chavez from Chavez's preacher, who was dabbling in liberation theology at the time, and he was a fairly progressive Catholic priest. Um, and the priest suggested Chavez to Ross as a really, really good person to have head the organizing campaign in California. And so Ross approaches Chavez at his house and convinces Chavez that he should become an organizer for the community service organization to help migrant farm workers, Mexican farm workers, uh, begin to vote in California. Um, and so Chavez from the Junk Pachuco becomes a CSO organizer now. He has a full-time job with the CSO. And he begins to organize voting rights campaigns in California and uh, agriculture sectors, which is very successful. And during this time, a lot of the CSO members themselves start to recognize that Chavez isn't just merely organizing voting campaigns. He's, he's talking about social rights. He's talking about uh, just basic dignity and justice. And he's, he's harping on creating a movement here. Um, and so a lot of people in the CSO who are a little more conservative saw this as, as the makings of a communist or a socialist radical kind of push in, in the union. And so he was kind of pushed out to the periphery of the union and labeled a communist, along with other people like Dolores Huerta and Gilbert Padilla, who were organizing as well uh, with Chavez. Um, and to exemplify his, his overarching uh, ability to go beyond just organizing for vote for voting campaigns and, and really talking about social rights and social justice issues for farm workers and Chicanos and creating an identity of Chicanos. The Oxner campaign is one where he goes to Oxner, California and not only organizes farm workers to vote, but he starts hearkening on social justice issues, um, dignity for people. He creates a movement, he creates an identity of, of a Chicano, of, of not just a worker, but of a Chicano that can be united uh, with other Chicanos uh, and Mexicans. Um, so that really exemplifies his early, his early spark he has to create a movement. And as a break from the CSO, Chavez kind of goes on his own between this urban and rural battle. The CSO wanted to focus more on the urban city Chicano issues, while Chavez wanted to focus more on the rural farm, worker, farm workers union. He yeah. want, and he wanted to focus on more of those rural issues rather than being in an urban area. Yeah, so to add on what she's saying, um, you know, Chavez, he, he splits with the CSO because the CSO, like she was saying, doesn't want to focus on farm workers anymore. They want to start moving towards more focusing on ur urban Chicano issues. Um, and the farm workers are kind of being left in the dust at this point, and Chavez can't take it. So he walks out in the meeting, very famous, famously walks out in a CSO meeting, and people are just aghast that Chavez would just leave the union. He's being paid full time. And, uh, he decides to go on his own and create his own union. Affluence is the biggest trap in this country because you can't change anything if you, if you want to hold on to a good job, a good way of life, and avoid sacrifice. This is a quote by Cesar Chavez in his um, autobiography, La Causa, in 1975. So I think uh, this quote exemplifies how Chavez's union, not only Chavez's union, but it was a big uh, part of forming the UFW, the union, how how he wanted to see the union become and uh, and grow. Uh, 
he was very dedicated to his cause, and this is almost a, you know, a religious devotion to his cause, if we look at this quote. Um, he's willing to sacrifice his job, he's willing to sacrifice everything, even you know, put his family through hard times uh, to create this union of his dreams. Um, and so as he creates the UFW, this idea this, from this quote is very essential to, to how we see the union develop. Um, so in 1965, fresh off the, out of the CSO, Chavez doesn't have a job, uh, his family's in kind of dire straits, um, but he asks his family to support him and his wife to support him in creating this new union, United Farm Workers Union. And so in Fresno, California, he gets together with Gilbert Padilla, Dolores Huerta, and other key members of the CSO organizing team who were really at the forefront of helping the CSO organize migrant farm workers. He gets together with them, he creates this new union, United Farm Workers Union, and it consists of this zealous spirit uh, and the CSO experiences. Uh, so this spirit of change and the spirit of sacrifice and drive that really was absent a lot of ways from the CSO now is present in the UFW union. Um, and just an example, there was all volunteer positions and like two paid positions in the UFW and they would get $5 a week in those, and Cesar was not a paid position. He refused to be paid from the union. Um, just another example of his willingness to sacrifice to the nth degree. Um, and this right here is El Nacriado, which is the publication that was created along with United Farm Workers Union. And this publication uh, really relied on images and iconic imagery of the struggle of the Chicano, of the Mexican in the field. Um, because a lot of Chicanos and Mexicans, especially Mexican farm workers and migrant farm workers, couldn't read. Uh, so the publication was heavy in images to, to convey an image of unity and, and of resistance for farm workers. Um, and Chicanos. And Emma Criado in Spanish roughly translates to kind of the, the brutish, uh, uncouth person, someone who is uh, you know, not civilized, someone who doesn't have any manners. Um, and so I think this label, that was the El Nacriado label that was unfairly given to the farm workers is a, it's kind of a reclamation of who they are and, and as not someone who's on the outside of society, but someone who does indeed count in society. One of the biggest actions of the, of the UFW was the Delano break, Grape Boycott. It not only involved the, our migrant farm workers, but Chicano activists, um, white activists, and everybody gathered as a unity for one cause. And another thing that, that was happening was, the, was these pickup plays made by Luis Valdez which he, when he created the El Teatro Campesino. He would just get all these workers in the back of pickups uniting just with megaphones, reading just, from, just straight from the paper. These people weren't actors. They were just people trying to create change in a way. And I have a book right here. This is um, one of the books of um, Luis Valdez's, all Luis Valdez's plays that were going on at this time as well. Um, another great ally of this boycott was the AFL-CIO and the AWOC, which is the Filipino Union. So it wasn't just one group of people, it was all kinds of different ethnicities, different cultures gathered together for change and for unity. And what else? Um, also as a stand, Chavez fasted for 25 days as a nonviolent protest. He wanted to make sure that no violence was used in these acts of change. Yeah, and add on to that, as Kayla was mentioning, um, Chicano activism, uh, unity with the Mexican farm workers really created a powerful force. Uh, for example, Mexican farm workers or migrant farm workers only have power when they're working, when they're in season, when they can pick grapes and they can pick vegetables, but that's only a small part of the season. But to really win against the growers and to get fair wages um, and you know, humane working conditions, all the things that they were fighting for, they needed to reach out and they needed to, to create a broader base of support, and to create a movement to ensure that the growers would fulfill the demands of the union. And so Chavez saw organizing with, with universities, with Chicanos, with white activists um, as very essential to get the word out. And so this boycott that was created really went beyond the fields and into the cities and into universities and into the, the popular political thought of the 1960s, which is already tumultuous uh, you know, because of other movements going on. Um, and so he tapped into that and was able to use that energy to get a very successful boycott. Um, so we have here a union of the two souls I feel like that at this point, the union 
was a synergy of the Mexican farm worker soul and the Chicano white activist soul. And that's why it was so successful in this boycott. That's why they got the demands met that they wanted, that they succeeded in, no, in ways that no other um, agricultural union movement had succeeded before. And so this union of the two souls was very important for the success. Um, I mean, the grapes were really, literally rotting on the vine in 1966. Nobody would pick grapes. Nobody would buy grapes in the store. So the, so the field owners had to give in to the demands of the worker. There was no choice. Uh, so this is very successful uh, boycott. And having that boycott was more successful than striking in itself. The boycott hurt the grape producers to their core. And so ultimately, they did have to give in to the rights of the farm workers. They had to give in to what they wanted, or else there would be no grapes. Uh, yeah, to add on to that, um, as it says here, the boycott became the essential activity of the union. Uh, a curious thing started to happen as Chavez realized that the boycott was so successful, he put a lot of energy into creating, into creating this idea of the boycott as the central part of the union. Um, and so it started to alienate a lot of, of organizers. And so the second point here says the boycott tail wags the farm worker dog. So basically that analogy means that although the very heart of the union was the farm worker, the boycott social activist sector of that union started to take over. There was not a lot of attention being paid to the farm workers in the fields as much as there was attention being paid to organizing boycott campaigns, creating propaganda, getting connected with uh, intellectuals in the cities and, and urban activists to, to further this movement. But what wasn't being seen was that they were losing the farm worker soul. That was being pushed aside to kind of grandify this, this whole uh, boycott action as, as the best thing that has ever happened to the union. Um, and so a, a, an example of, of how this could alienate the, the farm workers, uh, they, what the union started to do was publicity strikes. So uh, Chavez had ordered all the key union organizers who were in the fields to, uh, to move out of the fields into the cities to help organize these boycott campaigns. Well, the key organizers in the field weren't there anymore. Uh, so the, so the, the fields uh, became kind of a, a second thought. And what Chavez would do is he'd have all these key organizers come in to the fields for a short amount of time to help the workers strike uh, to get better wages and things like that. But it was all kind of a political game almost where they would get the workers to vote for some things in the union or vote in a local election and then they would pick up and leave and they would kind of leave the strikers without the support that they needed from those dedicated organizers on the ground. Um, so that really started to hinder the development of the union to, from its original goals. Ultimately, um, Chavez was kind of like this, as our title states, he was a saint-like figure. And as a subject to his criticisms, you couldn't bring, bring him down. It's like you don't put down your saint. You don't put down like this God kind of like figure that, that you have. And uh, for all that, he, that he's done, people thought of him more as like a saint-like figure. And to add on that, like you're saying that Chavez had this saint, saintly like uh, persona around him, it was really hard to criticize him because you didn't want to um, make the union look weak. And a lot of other organizers who didn't think Chavez's ideas of focusing more on the, the boycott uh, portion of the <coughs> union and the urban sector, the Chicano activism sector, uh, they, didn't, they didn't really know how to tell him without making the union look weak that he needed to start focusing more on the fields because they were losing support in the fields and that was the base of, of, of all of this. Um, and so as Chavez became more and more big headed, we could say, uh, and more convinced that the boycott was the only way to go, uh, a, a purge of key members began to happen. Gilbert Bahia was purged, um, a key organizer, um, and really things started to fall apart. Uh, so these souls were in disunion, the soul of the Mexican farm worker and the soul of the Chicano activists uh, were in disunion and they were competing against each other and the Chicano activists, the white activist soul was winning at this point. And that can be seen in the Salinas vegetable strike. Um, that really was a disaster. I mean, no support in the fields, no organization in the fields. Everybody was too worried about the boycott campaign, the propaganda campaigns. Um, and so the worker base suffered and the workers didn't trust the union as much as they did anymore. And so at that point, we see almost the complete dissolution of the union and a lot of the reversal of the union contracts that they had fought for so much uh, in the earlier years. 
Um, so I guess what we're trying to convey here is that in the long shadow of Cesar Chavez's legacy, um, although he did so much and was a great hero for many people, the actual union that was created and the systems in that union really hindered the progress of farm workers uh, as we look now in today's present situation of farm workers um, because of this inability to, to reconcile between the two souls of the union. And if that would have been able to happen, I feel like the union would have been a great success and we might have seen a lot of different conditions for farm workers today and even a stronger Chicano movement because of it. So, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. You in the back. How long did you work with the CSO? Uh, the CSO, he was with the CSO for, I believe, three years. Um, from my recollections, Chavez was against the um, Bracero program. The US yeah, exactly. In, yeah. During World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering why you guys thought that his position in the the um, UFW's position was that way? Was it kind of a capitalistic economic thing where if there's too many immigrant workers then they would lose their bargaining power? Or I uh, don't know, is there something else to it? Sure, I yeah, I think it, it has to do that um, in a sense. Um, they were worried about scabs, and a lot of times the Bracero program was used for, for scabs. I mean, when you had a strike of workers and you convinced everybody who's working in this particular freight field to strike, then the the farm worker could call up, you know, the U.S. government or say, "Hey, we need some workers here," you know. So they bring in undocumented workers from Mexico who are going to scab because they want the money. They're not concerned about the movement. They're not concerned. I mean, they don't have that identity. If that makes sense, um, you know, to, to be willing to strike with the union. They just want to make money for their family in Mexico and go back to Mexico. Um, so they were against that Bracero program because it it encouraged scabbing. It encouraged a disloyalty of the union. Um, and so there's a lot of criticism there, right? Because a lot of times the union, they would find out who was illegal and they would call up the, the ICE agents and they would say, hey, this guy's illegal, deport him, because he's scabbing. You know, we want all the scabs out. And so there's a lot of anger towards Chavez and the union because of that, because a lot of Mexicans felt like, well, we're just here at work and you're kicking us out of the country because you have this, some sort of movement that you're, you're fighting for. You know? So there was a disunion there between the Mexican workers and then the native-born migrant workers who were more involved uh, in the union. That answers your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Cool. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, so did the boycott, did it like crash because he overdid it or? Uh, not so, so much overdid it, I think. I think maybe that's, a, that's probably a fair uh, thing to say, I think. What he didn't do was recognize the base of support that was already there was the farm workers in the field. Right. And I was saying that after the success of the boycott, it became clear that, to Chavez anyway, that well, the only way to succeed again is to focus more on boycotting instead of striking, instead of only working in the fields. And so there was a, over, there was a push of, of just working with the boycott sector and the Chicano white activist sector instead of going back to the field and seeing what their needs were and kind of creating a cyclical relationship that included everybody in the union, and so it became more about these intellectual Chicano white activists kind of pushing the union in the direction uh, that let the farm workers out. And so I think if they would have unified those two things, another boycott would have definitely been successful. Can you talk about how you're promoting the Cesar Chavez movement through heritage programming here on campus? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you take care of that. Um, well, we've had this whole week of events dedicated to Cesar Chavez and the Chicano movement. And we started off with, actually, there's actually Cesar Chavez Day. We have the poster in our Casa House as well. But what year, what year was it? <laughs> was it last year? But they actually dedicated March 31st as Cesar Chavez Day. So we have a whole week of our programming. We. And we also, tomorrow we're actually going to go butcher a pig. <laughs> so talk, kind of talk about like that food preservation and just that, like, how our food gets to our plates. And that's the same thing I felt like Cesar Chavez did with the grape strikes and all that. Like, it takes somebody to actually work and do something to get the food that we see in our grocery stores. It's, 
it's really important that we know where things come from and the people that actually do work to bring us our food and give us sustainability as well. Surely. Surely. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, here in the valley, um, I don't know personally, but I've heard stories that it's not much better um, than what it would have been. Um, I mean, they're getting paid more. Um, I know more about what's happening in California. Um, a lot of growers in California are now required to provide uh, shade structures. Um, you can't work if it's over 100 degrees. Um, there's water and there's toilets provided, but beyond that, Union organizing attempts have been bleak at best in, in uh, California for growers, and I, don't, and I haven't heard of a union movement here at all uh, for migrant farm workers. It's just really hard to get that, galvanize that support because they're a transient population, um, and a lot of other factors come into play. Uh, so I would say, overall, not much has changed except for some basic human rights that were fought for in this time that are now place today in law. Um, so would you say that he's being celebrated more by the Chicano, uh, you know, rather than the Mexican? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's as simple as that, but I think overall, yes. Um, a lot of people, especially Mexican um, workers, have a, a tainted image of Chavez because of he, because he wanted to deport people from the Rush Out program, because he would go to those measures to get to take quote unquote illegal Mexicans out of the union because they wanted migrant native Mexi uh, Na uh, Mexican Americans who could vote and things like that. So I think in some ways that's 